Now in its 10th year, this is GabNet. Talk like you've never heard it before. Hey everybody, this is Alex, and this of course is the Ramble, and we go until midnight tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, he joins us every week, and he's been doing, we cover, I think I checked it out, what, I, what did I say, 230 of these that we've done? Two, I thought 240, something 240, like that. 240, some kind of, uh, you've been, we've been doing this a lot. We're right. logging in more hours than Hugh Downs. Than you Downs. <laughs> Remember, didn't he have the record for the most airtime on TV? For was it you Downs? For a long time, yeah. I think somebody may. Have, I think Regis Philbin may have passed him. It could have been. It could have been you Downs at one point, because he did the uh, he did the Today, Today show. show, and that was on every day. And then he went on and did a few other things. Uh, but uh, I I don't know that U Downs maintained that for very long. I think probably Regis did more time on television than anybody. I can't think of anybody else. But we just had Pat Sajak retire after 41 years of Wheel of Fortune. Wow. I'm surprised that man isn't brain dead. <laughs> Can you imagine going in and doing the same show day in and day out? Well, he probably, what do they tape, five in a day? Uh, He did, uh, yeah, he did did five a day, five in a day. They would do a week of them so that you would actually have uh, five weeks of programming. And he only did about 25 weeks, so they only had to work. That's one of the best jobs ever, if you don't let, it, so, if yeah. you don't let it rot your brain. Because you record, many times they would take a whole month, record the whole year. And then he was off for the rest of the year. Yeah. Got all his money for doing the show, you know. I'm going to tell you about somebody that I read about that I he was he was griping and complaining He's getting rid of his agents because his agents signed him for a three-year contract at HBO, another three years, renewal of three years. And uh, that was John Oliver. And he got, uh, they, they, he, he got rid of his agents because he felt they made a bad deal. They signed him up for three years without a raise. Now, that would make you mad, right? Uh-huh. Do you know what he's getting already? A million dollars an episode. Hey, he doesn't need a raise. <laughs> so he does 30 shows a year. Oh, my God, really? Yeah. So he walks away with $30 million every year. And he's firing his agents because they didn't get him a raise? I mean, a raise to what? God. So I feel a little less uh, uh, yeah, enamored uh, of John Oliver because of that crybaby attitude, you know. He's always complaining about the uh, greedy rich people too, isn't he? Yes, yes. And he is a rich person. He's very yeah. wealthy, you know. I mean, come on. I mean, I I don't know how much Bill Maher makes. I imagine he probably makes somewhat the same. I would imagine yeah. they're on par with each other. Well, I read the. I should have kept this book. I had a book that had the highest paid people in TV. And there was, uh, when I was a kid, I remember him, a guy named Gary Moore, apparently was the highest paid person in television. At, at that time, I, I think he was surpassed by any of the cast members of Seinfeld during their last four or five years. Oh, I'm sure. Well, they all made a million dollars a year, uh, an episode. Which gave him $22 million a year. That's a lot of money. Oh, yeah. You know. And then Jerry owned part of the show, as did Larry David. Cause well, that's they, where the real money is. Because they created it. He walked away after they, uh, somebody bought them out uh, for, I think, a half a billion dollars. 
I thought it was eight hundred million. It was at eight hundred million. Well, but, yeah. but no, but I think it was five hundred million for Jerry, five hundred million for Larry. Mm-hmm. And then Larry got divorced, so he had to give some of that up. But and I think Jerry now has close to a billion because he invested it, did all wise things with it. Then he did uh, comedians in cars getting coffee, which is you know. I think he. I think he was getting thirty million a year for that. Yeah. So I mean, he he he's a billionaire. Okay. He's a money machine. Yeah. So when you talk about rich guys in television, I would say that Larry David and 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 also Larry David then did Curb Your Enthusiasm, and that was after the divorce. Mm-hmm. So he got all the money from that, and I think he's a billionaire now, too. Mm-hmm. Can you feel sorry for a comedian who makes a billion dollars? No. No, I, I don't think so. You know. Who was the highest wanna... paid comedian when you were coming up? Do you remember? The highest paid comedian was... Um... Prior, maybe, or Carlin? Steve, Mar- well, Steve Martin. He Steve wasn't Martin. That long. Steve Martin. No, Steve Martin, though, while he was going strong, made a, shall we say this, a shitload of money. You know, he was, he was I, in fact, to this day, I think he remains the most successful comedian of all time. I don't think I recall anyone, rec- any comic creating that kind of uh, excitement like he was like a rock star uh, uh, rock, he was a rock star yeah I went to one of his concerts in uh, at the Nassau Coliseum that place holds like 30,000 40,000 people and he's doing comedy and it's one of the reasons <laughs> it's one of the reasons he quit doing stand up was because he said you know, once you get to that level, it's not fun anymore. You know, you're just going out there and talking to this just blanket of people. And it doesn't have the feeling that you're doing stand-up any longer. You know, so he, yeah. after, uh, after I think it was after maybe three, four years of doing stand-up, he quit. And he said, you know, uh, you, you, you go in, and you can relate to this. You go in, you've got your set. You've got the stuff you created. You go on stage and you do it. And you can do it in this town. You can do it this town, this town, that town. You don't have to reinvent yourself. Okay? Because I bet you've got jokes in your act right now that you did when you first started doing comedy. Uh, Close, yeah. Yeah, close. He said, by the time I got to my third hour of material, that was the time to quit comedy. He said, I couldn't come up with any more. You know, it was time to move yeah. on to other stuff. Yeah, he said that about comics that write a new hour every year. He says that's kind of a folly that uh, nobody has more than two or three hours. Uh, yeah, and he felt he only had three hours. Three good hours. Good, I mean, where he good could, for him, yeah. Yeah, well, you know. I mean, how many, how, many, how many hours do you have you had in your lifetime? As a comedian, I Can might you, have an hour and a half. I would think maybe hour forty-five. If yeah, I could put it all together, but 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 th- that's largely the ability of being a, and the benefits of being a lesser-known comic is you're not being forced to come up with absolutely new material. Yeah, if you're time. doing a special and uh, you do that, then you, you blow come everything up with all you've stuff. got. You've blown your whole act. You do yeah. one Netflix special. You know, and that's it. Speaking of Netflix specials, you went down and did the Netflix what? The, what do they call it? Comedy is not funny or something. Netflix is a joke festival. Yeah. Yeah, Netflix is a joke which, festival, which it, has become a huge, huge festival. Well, they were doing some TV shows. You're doing some Netflix shows out of there with John Mulaney, which were really terrible, by the way. I don't know if you saw any of them. Well, yeah, he, I haven't seen him, but someone tells me he fills arenas. So. He fills arenas, and he's a very funny guy, but, you know, I think I, I, he wasn't funny on these shows he did for Netflix. It was yeah. very, very labored. But anyway, so you went down there for the Netflix is a joke festival because uh-huh. uh, Esparza, what's his first name? Uh, Felipe. Felipe Esparza uh. invited you to what, open mm-hmm. for him? Is that it? 
No, he had a he he wanted to put something a little different together. He called it sideshow, and he had three comics and three circus performers. <laughs> well, that's a good idea. Yeah. That's so a- I was between a contortionist and a sword swallower. Well, do you remember when I did the thing at the Frost Amphitheater? I brought in variety acts as well. Yeah, that was fun. I had a guy with falcons or something that flew over the audience. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, uh, because, again, I, I came up with the theory about the problem with comedy shows was that you put up a comedian followed by a comedian followed by a comedian <laughs> followed by a comedian. Yeah, then after a while, it starts to look like an open mic. Yeah, well, the thing is that in, in the days of vaudeville, the wonderful thing about vaudeville was that you had a variety of acts. Yeah. And so if you were sitting there watching a, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, one of those shows, uh, burlesque, I think they called it at that time, uh you could be watching an act you didn't like that much, but you knew that 10 minutes later there would be another act on that you would maybe thoroughly mm-hmm. enjoy. And there were like jugglers, followed by comedians, followed by singers, followed by, you know. And to me, the variety of that uh, was uh, priceless. But today, yeah, that's, one comedian that's Pretty follow- much what the Ed Sullivan show was. E- exactly. One comedian follows another comedian, follows another comedian, and after a while you go, now wait a minute, what other, in what other business do you do that, you know? And, and you're right, yeah. Ed Sullivan was successful because he, he had the vaudeville, uh, burlesque was a term I used, which is wrong, it's called vaudeville. Vaudeville. You yes, had, you uh, had, uh, you have a ventriloquist, a senior wenches. Yeah, a po- Topo Gigio. And uh, Edie Gourmet singing a song, and then the Beatles. And then the Beatles, and then uh, who, who was the, uh, wasn't there a comedian that had to follow the Beatles on one of those shows? I'm trying to remember who it was, but yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, well, you know, I, I was told, and I don't know if this is true, that the all the uh, Beatles segments in the Ed Sullivan show were pre-recorded. Because they didn't feel that they could have a bunch of kids screaming and then bring on, you know, Alan and Rossi. Okay? Because <laughs> that, the well, kids. That would make sense. The yeah. kids would sit there on their hands waiting for the Beatles to be come back because Sullivan was smart. He opened with the Beatles and he closed with the Beatles. Yeah. Um, and I was told those were pre recorded. Because they okay. just, you know, they just didn't. Then they could turn the audience over and get a more adult audience in there who would then watch Topo Gigio. You know. um, because that, that was the only way to do it. I don't think you could do it any other way. They wouldn't stop screaming. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, that that show probably had like a Super Bowl rating. Uh, it was it was huge. I mean, he did. They did what? They do four shows for Sullivan, I think. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and then they went to a format which nobody else did. They pre-recorded their music. They filmed it. They turned out music videos. If, uh, people say, where did the music videos start? And I said, it had to have been the Beatles. Because that's the first time I remember any artist pre-recording their music on film and doing kind of a, you know, bringing in a filmmaker or somebody to give it a certain... Uh, uh, feel to it or whatever, you know, certain special quality to it. And um, so the Beatles were, that was their their thing. And um, uh, they would then send Ed or Jack Parr or anybody uh, a film and say, here, we'll be on your show next week, but you got to take the film. So that's what happened there. God, I wonder how. Uh, huh? I wonder how Ed Sullivan found out about the Beatles. It seems like. A, well, a he, 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 he give Ed a lot of credit. He put his ear to the to the ground. Well, that's right. He did. He did have Elvis back in the, pre, oh, he, in the he, prehistoric era. He was always on top of everything, you know. And it wasn't that he was a hip guy or anything. He just knew that he had to keep fresh and and new. And hey, I gotta have Elvis Presley on, 
That's what the kids are listening to now, you know. And I'm not going to lose an audience because Topo Gigio goes on right after him, you know. So Topo Gigio, by the way, in case people don't remember, was an Italian puppet uh, back in the day. So. <laughs> Topo Gigi. Yeah, Topo Gigi. Yes, Ed. Hello, Ed. Yeah, I seem to remember that voice. I, you know. You know, Ed had a he uh, used Dangerfield quite a bit on his show. Yeah, I mean, he um, well, he he loved good comedians. You know, hell, you might have even wound up on the Ed Sullivan show. <laughs> well, I wound up on his stage. You anyway. wound up on his <laughs> stage. Did you feel when you did uh, Letterman? Uh, at the Ed Sullivan Theater. Did you feel any sense of history when you were there? Oh, I, that's the first thing I felt was I think all the famous people had been on that stage, the Beatles, Elvis, and yeah. Yeah, and and you go back and you you look at old Ed Sullivan shows when he says, and out in our audience tonight, you know, so-and-so, and you see the theater itself with the audience, it's the same side walls, everything. It, it, it's, it's literally uh, the, the theater we got used to with uh, David Letterman. Yeah. That was the best thing David Letterman ever did, was deciding to use that theater because it became so historic, and he became a part of Broadway. Yeah. You know, big little sign there, David Letterman, you know, big theater. It was, it was great. It was terrific. Uh, but they also did a lot of other shows out of there. They did, like, The Price is Right. I don't know. They did game shows out of there for years. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> well, once Sullivan either left, quit doing his show or died, they, um, they started using that theater for other CBS shows. So if it was, a, you know, a, some kind of game show, that game show would come out of there. So... You know, that, but when when David took it over, it supposedly was a mess. There was like, you know, six inches of standing water inside the theater and everything. They just really had to do a quick fix on that place. But, so you'd have to work that. that theater. You know, a theater I worked that made me very. I suddenly felt I had made it, and I don't know why. Because I'm, I wasn't a performer particularly. Uh, but I had to call my mother from backstage and say, Ma, guess where I am? And I'm about to go on stage. And she said, where? And when I told her, she almost became apoplectic. <laughs> and the words that came out of my mouth, of course, was Carnegie Hall. Wow. I was doing a, I still have a poster from it, a, a picture of the poster of the front of the theater. It was an evening with Stan Lee, and it was a Marvel night at Carnegie Hall. And Stan asked me to read a part. They were doing readings of comic books, and oh, he great. asked he asked me to play one of the characters. It was uh, one of the characters in the Fantastic Four, or one of the evil guy in the Fantastic Four. I can't remember his name now. See, folks, that's how much I care about comic. Books. Well, uh, that was the theater that uh, everyone uh, dreamed about. Was the, when, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And the answer was, of course, practice. Practice. <laughs> but but then, but that was the uh, yeah. Carnegie Hall was the uh, epitome, I think. Of, yeah. Well, uh, what it was the the, uh, the thing about Carnegie Hall, most people didn't realize is that anybody could play Carnegie Hall. Why do you say that, Alex? Because you rented Carnegie Hall, <laughs> they didn't. They didn't go out and get Axe to play Carnegie Hall. Axe went to Carnegie Hall and said, "We want to rent the place for a night." And uh, I remember they would even have people like there was a woman. They made a movie about it with Meryl Streep called Florence Foster Jenkins. Florence Foster Jenkins was a great patron of the arts. Uh, she also thought she could sing. And she would try and sing opera. And she was just horrible. She was just terrible. And she would go out and rent out Carnegie Hall. And all her friends who wanted to make her feel good would buy tickets. Jesus. And she would sell out Carnegie Hall. And then she would do this, uh, this, uh, this uh, 
concert with her accompanist, whose name was, are you ready for this? And I found out it really was his name, Cosmo McMoon. <laughs> and she would give her little concerts, and then everybody would applaud and say, oh, wonderful, Florence, you know, whatever, maybe even a standing ovation. And then they'd wait till next year when she did it again. And they loved her so much, nobody wanted to tell the singer, you really stink. So she had no idea she sucked. Yeah, I used to have a recording that was made of Florence Foster Jenkins at Carnegie Hall. Uh, wow. It was on RCA. And it was a best-selling album because people all wanted an album of this woman who absolutely couldn't sing. But it was, uh, you know, it was, it, they made a movie of it called Florence Foster Jenkins with uh, um, um, Meryl Streep as Florence Foster Jenkins. Um, and uh, also uh, the guy from, uh, from uh, Big Bang Theory uh, played her pianist, Cosmo McMoon. <laughs> Yeah, and that's it, such a great name. It's a great little movie. It's a, it's a it's a beautiful story because just somebody who so loved music, she wanted to be able to sing it. You know, there there was nothing horrible about her. She the only thing horrible about her was how badly and horribly she sang. But nobody would wow. make fun of her. Nobody would make fun of her. So. And uh, do you remember how big a theater that was? I would like to think, if I remember it, maybe it had a thousand to a couple of thousand seats. Okay. I would think it was not a it was not a huge theater by by theater standards. It's still there, you know. You can still rent out Carnegie Hall, and call your mother and say, "Mom, guess where I am." You know. We could rent it out and do a Bennett Presents. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I could afford it. To be honest with you. I wonder what it costs. Jeez, I I don't know what it costs to rent car. I should look it up someday. You know? Yeah, probably has a standard price. You know. Um, also, it may depend on what you want to do in there too. You know, if you just want to do stand up acts, probably cheaper than if you wanted to run a symphony orchestra out of there or something like that. And supposedly the acoustics, I don't remember them myself. But the acoustics in Carne in the old Carnegie Hall were wonderful, supposedly terrific. Singers loved it. Uh, Sinatra did concerts there. Judy Garland did concerts there. And it was just... But the name Carnegie Hall... In fact, there was even a movie called Carnegie Hall. The name Carnegie Hall just became this, you know, this special thing in show business. And... Uh, you know, and it, of course, prompted that old joke about the guy in New York yeah. walking down the street. It says, "How do you get to Carnegie Hall?" And the guy says, "Practice." Yeah, yeah I didn't know anybody could rent it out. <laughs> yeah, no, it wasn't. Everybody always thought it was this wonderful place. You had to really yeah. work in show business to finally play <laughs> Carnegie Hall. No, you had to work enough in show business so you could afford to rent out Carnegie Hall. You know. And everybody <laughs> wanted to play there. You know, it was just yeah. an icon of, of, of showmanship. So anyway, that's, you know, a little... Uh, did looks, I ruin... It looks good on the resume. Did I ruin something for somebody out there who <laughs> thought that Carnegie Hall was this wonderful place? So anyway, so uh, the uh, comedy festival, went, did you, you went on? Went on. That was fun. And a good how'd you, show. How'd you go over? It Good. It was easy. I had to... I think uh, following a contortionist, they were ready for something. Yeah, but when you went on and you did your act and you walked off, did you feel, hey, I did pretty well? Yeah, I thought I did well. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you're kind of blasé about it, but, I mean, how do you define good to you? I might mean, it must be a pretty high standard. Uh, yeah, I, I got laughs. Uh, yeah, I was happy with it. I wasn't uh, usually come off a... Uh, if I don't do well, I'm really pissed off. So yeah, I was, yeah. I was in a good mood. Yeah, but they didn't they didn't uh, film you or do anything like that. No, at no. The Netflix festival. Right. Uh, and again, that was another that was another stage that was called the Avalon Theater, which used to be the Hollywood Palace, which had a TV show called the Hollywood Palace. Uh, right, right. In the '60s. Yeah. 
But anyway. And they had a girl come out with a card that introduced the act, and the girl on TV it was her first job was Raquel Welch. Oh, boy, now that's trivia. Yeah. I saw an opening for what show? We're running a little bit out of time here, but I'm trying to remember some show that I was watching, an old show. The old Frank Sinatra's show or some of the Edsel show. And they had a bunch of women, um, you know, kind of at the beginning going, you know, it's Frank Sinatra's, blah, blah, blah. The Edsel show, blah, blah, blah. And one of the women, I swear, is Mary Tyler Moore. You know? Wow. I used to have a record album where Mary Tyler Moore was on the cover wearing a bathing suit. This is what she She did in the early days. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, hey, listen, we've run out of time here. God, I have fun. It just flew by. I have fun with you. It's flown by for 242 yeah. episodes. <laughs> Let's do another 240. Okay. I hope I live long enough. Yeah, me and you both. Talk to you next week, okay, my friend. Alex. That's Larry Bubbles Brown, folks. Now in its 10th year, this is GabNet. Talk like you've never heard it before. And thanks to Larry Bubbles Brown, ladies and gentlemen, a uh, guy who we think is just the best. Okay? Let me admit some people here. Uh, let me see here. Here we go. There we go. Uh, Charlie Wallace. And let me see here. Who else have we got? Uh, we ha- Oh, there's, there's our good friend uh, Josh Wheeler. And Vernon Nunn is joining us, by the way, from Kentucky. Uh, but we have to wait for him to, you know, sign in. There we go. It looks like it's happening. Okay. Hi, everybody. How you doing this evening? Very good. You're doing okay? Yeah? Okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I, uh, I don't know if you can tell the difference, but I have a new microphone. And, uh. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah. It, it's um, it it what it does is it has a lot more volume to it, so I'm able to like you know. So now when you uh, when you yell at Alan, he'll be able to hear you even more clearly. That's correct. You know. <laughs> but this is like a three hundred buck mic I went out and bought. I want. I just felt uh, after all these years. I see. I don't care about my microphone particularly. Some guys are very, very particular about it. Like Howard Stern has a certain kind of, of, of microphone he uses and a kind of a, a way in which he sets the sound on it and so on and so particular about it. I never cared. Microphone was something I talked into, and how good or bad it sounded was more dependent on my voice than anything else, you know. But uh, I decided what the hell, you know. I may as well, before I shuffle off this mortal coil, get myself a, a decent microphone. Uh, plus, this is very, very directional. And, like, for instance, I have a fan on here on the air conditioning. You can't hear it, right? You know? Because, no. because if I move to the other side of the microphone here, you can barely hear me. See? So, <laughs> uh, it's exactly the kind of microphone I've needed for this. Hello to Josh, hello to Charlie, hello to Vernon, and hello to Tom Yamaguchi. What, two times this week so far? Mm-hmm. See? See? Yeah, I, I decide I'll call when I actually have something to say. Oh, okay. And sometimes I get a t- chance to say it <laughs> before the hour's <laughs> ended. Yeah, but before Alan gets here. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> uh, well, obviously you had something to talk about, so why don't you... I do. Uh, would you like an obituary? Uh, well, I don't like an obituary. <laughs> well, would you like somebody else's obituary? <laughs> Absolutely, I would like... Well, it's not that I would like it. You know, I can't like an obituary. Well, but... he was pretty old. You know who I'm talking about. Uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, yeah, what's his name, yeah. right? <laughs> Donald Sutherland. Donald Sutherland, yeah. 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 So the reason, you know, of course, everybody's reporting that story. But uh, the one thing, and I've mentioned this before, um, that, uh, that well, of course, uh, Donald Sutherland was married three times. Yeah. 
His second wife was a woman named Shirley Douglas. And Shirley Douglas was the daughter of a man in uh, Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan, Canada. He was a premier of Saskatchewan. Well, uh, Sutherland, was Sutherland was Tommy, born. Tommy Douglas. And yep. what did Tommy Douglas do for us? Or at least what he did for Canada, he was gave it single payer health care. Really? Yes, he is the fa he was a socialist mm -hmm. and he 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 created uh, single payer health care for Canada. That's incredible. That's great. You see yeah. you, you mentioned Donald Sutherland Canada. The reason Canada is so prominent in his life is he was born there. He was raised yeah, there. He was a Canadian. Canada. Yeah. He was one of yeah. those actors who came down here and stole jobs from a good American actors, you know. Yeah. And one of the, we well, had two children with, um, with Shirley Douglas, and one of them was Kiefer Sutherland. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I actually looked this up at DV, IDBD because I saw the movie, but I forgot when it was, was made. It was 2011. He narrated a documentary called The Healthcare Movie, where he actually talks about or the movie actually talks about the Canadian system of health care. Oh, really? Uh, and they start with uh, CBC in 2004. Mm -hmm. They had a contest to find out who was the greatest Canadian history. And the winner was Tommy Douglas. Wow. So, yeah, I recommend the movie. Basically, what they do is uh, they, they dispel a lot of myths about the health, Canadian health care system. Yeah. Like, they, you know, it's... There's long, you know, there's there's long uh, wait periods to get anything. They're not getting good service, blah, blah, blah. And everybody up in Canada just loves it. And you know, interview people. I've never to, heard. Maybe, I've, I, maybe I, like the I, surgeries, I, have to wait a while. But I get what I need, you know. I've known some Canadians, and uh, none of them ever complain about the health service. None of them. Uh, they uh, all all say it's terrific. You know, there they are. They three there, years longer than us. What? Canadians, on average, live three fucking years longer than Americans. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. That's how good their health care system is and how bad ours is. Yeah, well, you know, our our health system isn't that great. You know whose health system is better than ours? Cuba. Everybody. Cuba. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, again, uh, they have, you know, um, what do you call it, health? Uh, boy, my mind these days is just single payer, single payer health plan. So, um, oh, oh I, I I hate to mention this again because I mentioned this the last couple of nights, but you probably weren't maybe listening uh, last night when I announced that uh, Christy Frazier has died. Remember Christy? Yeah, that was the night before. Night before, or so you were here for that? Yeah, I would, yeah, I called in. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, I, I just yes, want to make yes. sure you knew that. You know, people. Oh yeah, yeah. People As who I listen. Then, uh, you know, I used to be a, a, the studio audience. Yeah. And uh, and uh, yeah, she was, she was just wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I tell you, it was one time. Remember the the, um, the show you did on uh, well, an excursion boat that went out of, under the the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. Oh yeah, I hated that. <laughs> I hated that. There's well, nothing my, worse. There's nothing worse than being on a boat with fans. Yeah, that's true. Y you know. But anyway, I enjoyed the show, and uh, among the people was Will Durst. Yeah, I remember it. Will Durst on that show. Yeah. But um, my ex was very pregnant at the time with our second, and we had just gotten off BART, and we were running to catch the boat, and Christie's. No, no, take your time, take your time. She thought that my ex was going to give birth right there. <laughs> we were running to catch the boat, but uh, yeah, but we made the boat, and it was a and it was a live radio broadcast, and we were right underneath the Golden Gate Bridge, and I'm back. It was fun. Yeah, I mean, you made it, but I loved it. I know that most of these people here, who uh, when I mention Christy, they don't know who she is because you know uh, they have lived in other states over the years and know me from other places than San Francisco. But uh, in fact, uh, Tom was with me when I was inducted into the 
uh, uh, Radio Bay Hall Area of Fame. Radio Bay, Hall of Fame. Bay Area Radio Hall of Fame. That's yeah. right down the street from me, you know, the Marina in Berkeley. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So Renee uh, was there, and Will with his Freedom underwear and. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, by the way, we have we have uh, Jeff with us tonight, but he's doing his Kilroy was here impression. <laughs> hey guys. No, but you know when I say that, you you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, um, yeah. Yeah. You, you know what I'm talking about, right, Jeffrey? And sure. Charlie, you know what I'm talking about when I say Kilroy was here. Uh, I don't know where that whole thing started. But all I know is that when I was a kid, everywhere you went was this Kilroy was here kind of, it was a guy with his nose hanging over a wall yeah. or something, you know. And and that's what Jeff looks like when he first comes on and, you know. But now he's okay. Oh, your wife's agreeing with you, right? Yeah. No, no, no. My, uh, my son's over here and his friend. Yeah. Pam and... Yeah. And, uh, I gotta talk to you any day. <laughs> Hello to Brian. Hello, Bri. Yeah. Hello. Uh, uh, how are you? Yeah, hi. How are you? Yeah. Brian, Brian do you remember Christy? Yeah, oh, yeah. Actually, I mentioned you on the show the other day because I said, like, like Tom said, she was always very nice. Always very nice to everyone. Yeah. 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 What? I like. Yeah. She was. She was very pretty. So. Where are all those very voices nice coming from? Yeah. Wait, where are the voices coming from? Here? Oh, yeah. 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 That's probably Pam. Can you, yeah. can you mute? Yeah, I'm going to see oh, if I can. Can you, do you know how to mute your, your phone? He did. Or your, or your, uh, your yeah, computer? Yeah, no, I mentioned you, Tom, because you said that she was really nice to the studio audience all the time. I've only been there a few times, but she was, yeah, she was really nice. There. Yeah, she was really nice. Yeah. Really nice. But anyway, so that that's kind of sad. But uh, very. Anyway, I got something I wanted to talk about tonight. I I really was going to talk about it last night, and then I don't know. We just got on a whole bunch of other stuff, and I, I didn't uh, I didn't get into it. Um, but the you do, you do know about uh, is it Texas where they? Oh no, Louisiana. Louisiana, yeah. Where they have said that they've made a bill. And they put it, they literally made it a law that every classroom in uh, the state of yeah. Louisiana, even in college, have to have a copy of the Ten Commandments on the yeah. wall. And the governor said, well, you know, the Ten Commandments everybody should know because basically they're the basis for a lot of the law that we have. And I went back and I, you know, because I'm not the most religious guy in the world and I thought I would check out the um, the uh, uh, Ten Commandments. Um, do do uh, 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 J Josh? I know that you know the uh, Constitution of the United States and the Bill of Rights, but can you tell us the Ten Commandments? If I think about it slowly, I could probably name them. Perhaps. Well, there's probably one or two you'd miss. Maybe. You know, I would. You know. Was I was forced into uh, an undergraduate education at a Christian college. So. Well, the thing I always thought was... I came from a home that... Yeah. You know, I've, I've been around it a lot in my life. The thing I always thought was uh, kind of um, a weird and diametrically opposed in the Ten Commandments is that at least about a half of them are negative morality and half of them are positive morality. In other words, you start off with thou shalt not okay and you get around to thou shalt towards the end but i'm looking at these and i'm thinking well you know if if indeed this was what a basic laws are based on and so on and i i i wouldn't argue it but the fact is it is terribly religious you know it's not just i thought uh maybe it's a little on the little bit off the beaten path religious but you start off and you've got, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Well, I'm telling you right now, we're, we're right off the bat going into religion. What are you saying? What do you, what do you, you want to say something, Charlie? Yeah. 
all of the Catholic Ten Commandments are negative. There are no positive Ten Commandments in the Catholic Church. Wait a minute, did they change them? Our Ten Commandments were completely, not completely, but very different from the Ten Commandments that the Protestants have. Really? I don't know which ones he wants in the in the schools, but I assume it's not the Catholic ones. Well, well I've got a Catholic Bible. I could check. Hold on. <laughs> yeah. I like the condensed version that uh, <laughs> that George Carlin put out. Yeah. <laughs> the the con condensed version. And yeah, watch, the it, end watch it. Does... Watch it on YouTube sometime. George Carlin says you can take the Ten Commandments and combine the ones that are duplications and say, okay, well, if you just change a few words here and there, now, boom, down. You, now you're down to five. And he gets it down to, like, two commandments. Don't kill anybody and, and be nice to people. Well, I mean, basically, you, you should have only one commandment. Don't do anything to hurt anybody else. You know. I agree. But, so, anyway. This, this is the, what's it called? The New Catholic Edition of the Holy Bible is dedicated to St. Joseph. And right there on the front, it says, one, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Okay, that's Two, close, that's close to the one. Now give us- Thou shalt not give, take the name of the Lord thy God okay, in vain. Okay, well, wait a minute, Look, hold on a second. That one is number three on this list that's that I have. That's what I'm saying, they're different. <clears throat> yeah. Well, yeah, but you said that they're all negative. Well, well, this are, this is positive? from the Church of, 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 of Latter Day Saints, okay, the Mormons. So number two is, "Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image." See, that's not a Catholic Ten Commandments. We didn't have anything about that. Uh, see, graven Ooh. image is anything so, that you that you 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 so love this is, more than this is God. Interesting. This is interesting. I never realized this before. So, so basically, what the the, the uh, Louisiana uh, state is doing is they specified the font, the readability, and all, but they do say whose Ten right. Commandments. I've never heard that anybody bring that up in all the discussions I've been hearing. Well, they I say which whose Ten they're Commandments, they're and I always argue about. Well, what about you know the the Hindu books or the uh, the, the the Muslim books or whatever, but. Within each religion, everybody has their own different version of the Ten Commandments. What's so if I'm a Catholic and I say, hey, why is it my version of the Ten Commandments up there on the wall? That's what I was saying. See, I always oh, thought... Well, I thanks, always, Charlie. <laughs> see, this how, this how thanks for, for, for bringing that out. This is, how, this is how stupid I am. Hmm? I actually believed that there was only one Ten Commandments. You know, and I, I, I pretty well thought that was the one that was in the Cecil B. DeMille movie, you know. <laughs> um, but, I bring you these 15. <laughs> okay, oh, well, the I second one here, according to the Mormons, is thou shall not make unto thee any graven image. That means uh, cars, clothes, sports, uh, even our jobs are dangerous things to war worship, okay? So a graven image is anything you want to worship beside God. I... I, I, up until now, I haven't known what a graven image was, you know. Uh, no, nor have I cared, law, actually. What? It, Louisiana law quotes specific Ten Commandments. It says word for word what each commandment is. And it's not the Catholic Ten Commandments. Well, yeah. first of all, next, it says, Thou shalt not take the name of the, the Lord in vain, or God in vain. Yeah. That would mean you can't go, God damn it. You know, yeah, that's right. number two here. That's number yep. two in okay. the Catholic Bible. Yeah. yeah, number two. Number four is remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So, so far, we three. have four very selfish and egotistical commandments made by God. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to love me. You're going to think I'm great. You're not going to take any graven images and if I could be, not going to take my name in vain. You're going to do the Sabbath day and keep it holy. It isn't until you get to the fifth commandment that you maybe get something you can't argue about. Mm. Honor thy father and thy mother. Of course, unless they oh. were brutal parents who beat the crap out of you, <laughs> you know, then are you that's, supposed that's to? That's number four. Huh? That's number four with the Catholics. What, with number four with the Catholics? Yeah. yeah. 
Really? Yeah. So what don't they have that I've they mentioned? They have the graven so image one. The they, graven image, yeah. They don't have right. the graven image thing? They say, I am the Lord, the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange God before me, so which so might be... Yeah, oh, let's, throw, let's, let's consider graven images, uh, images part of that, you know? Okay. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. Honor thy father and thy mother is number five. We should have, I wish we had... Uh, um, I wish we had David Letterman reading these off as the top ten commandments. Well, then we'd have to read ten first. It, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's uh, good. Yeah. Well, anyway, thou shalt. Number not, nine. Wait a minute. Thou shalt not kill. That's that's okay. I that you could put up on the wall. I wouldn't be bothered with that. I don't think any of us would. Have, but thou shalt not commit adultery. Mm hmm. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Yep. Uh huh. I don't, I don't know how I, uh, well, there's one I've kind of blown to bits. <laughs> thou shalt too. Uh, well, thou, thou shalt not steal. See, mm -hmm. these are these are good. These are these, uh, yet the five and, and below, they start getting okay. They, they, they Good moral precepts to live by. Thou mm -hmm. shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Hmm, Trump. Well, well, wait a minute. I'm going to get to that in a minute here. Uh, uh, it, it, but it's well, it, this one is about honesty. If you lie to someone, you are bearing false witness and may cause harm to yourself and others. This is a, the translation by the Mormons. Okay. Mm -hmm. And finally, thou shalt not covet. Actually, I've also heard it as you shall not covet thy neighbor's wife nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Right. Um, so, it, yeah, the Catholics it. have two. So nine is yeah. thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's good wife, and ten thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's goods. Well, don't goods and wives so come wife under the same category? <laughs> wife is a, a step up above, above the other possessions uh, a yeah. man has, obviously. Yeah. Now, well, in other words, we shouldn't covet uh, Brian's uh, McLaren. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Or as candy. But let's go back now to the very top here. Um, well, in fact, let me, let me, uh, Ten Commandments in Louisiana. Uh, let's see if they have anything on this. You know, what it doesn't specify in the law is what language to put it in. They ought to put it in Arabic. In all these schools. Well, you know, uh, uh, let's see, Ten Commandments, oh, Louisiana, okay. Do they have it? Uh, let me see. Louisiana's Ten Commandments law. Uh, the, uh, Ten Commandments law raises new concerns. I wish it, it doesn't list what the Ten Commandments are. Um, uh, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, getting back to this, if we go back and uh, we uh, we go to the Ten Commandments. Uh, most of them have been broken by Donald Trump. If not all. If not oh. all. <laughs> well, I should not have any of the gods before me. Uh, you know, he thou shalt not money. make uh, unto thee any yeah. graven image. Uh, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. I'm sure he's, or he's done that. Uh, remember the Sabbath okay. day and keep it holy. Yeah, like when's the last time he went to church? Mm -hmm. Okay. Honor thy mother and father. Yeah. <laughs> Thou shalt not kill. Well, that, he hasn't done that yet that we know well, of. Well, yeah. He threatened to, though. Well, actually, when you think of all the people uh, that died in COVID based on his, his incompetence, he oh, certainly yeah. did kill. He killed, killed tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands yeah. of people needlessly. Yeah. One point two million. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that should not commit adultery. Well, <laughs> you, you, you know. <laughs> uh, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Hmm. That means that thirty thousand uh, documented lies during his four years. Exactly. <laughs> and thou shalt not covet. Uh, he is uh, jealous because our president is currently in the White House instead of him. 
I mean, he, he uh, you know, he, he, he breaks most of these things. So if they're on a wall in, in, uh, in Louisiana, what is this? Don't, it should be, have, instead of the Ten Commandments at the top, it said, don't be like Donald Trump, and here's why. <laughs> you know. But it's, it is a good question. Which Ten Commandments? I didn't realize that. It's a very good point. Um, well, you know, when I was a kid, Alex, uh, we used to, uh, you probably remember too, remember when they had, they'd open the school uh, day with a prayer? Oh Let's well, that that bo that bothered me because I live. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I can imagine it could be, be being Jewish, but even me growing up then as a Catholic, the Lord's Prayer, the Protestant version, is actually different. It's actually longer. It is a, a part of the go. And thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. The Catholics don't have that part in. And I would well, just feel here, really. Here, here's what used to happen to me in school. Okay. Uh, I was the only Jew practically in the whole neighborhood. I was brought up in North Beach, which was primarily at the time when I first went to school in an Italian neighborhood, which means a Catholic, Catholic neighborhood, okay? And at school, they would bring somebody in like, uh, like Father Larry from down at the church, right? To mm -hmm. like give a prayer at the beginning of our school day. And uh, they, he, they were kind of funny about it. You know, they would go, oh, God, please bless our parents and please bless our, our, our people and the this and the that and so on and so forth. And I'm, I'm going, okay, as a Jew, this is okay with me, you know? And then at the very end, while I've got my head bowed because I don't want to not bow because all the other kids are bowing their heads and if I don't, they're going to go, there's the Jew boy. Okay, mm -hmm. um, he sneaks in. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, I mean, and and that always. But that after that, it really bothered me whenever they would have any kind of prayer in school, because the question again goes back to the thing we were talking about with the Ten Commandments. What prayer? From who? What religion? Mm -hmm. You know, and and didn't you're get, didn't that get started in our public schools back in the fifties when they put in God we trust on our money and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Well, you, I'll tell you yeah. what we did when I first went to school. It was I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice at all yeah. for all. What wasn't in there it was under God. Under God, under right. God. Yep. That was Eisenhower added. Put that in. Eisenhower put that in. You know why? Because of yep. the Red Scare. Yep. Because the, the commies were godless people, and so we, they threw that in there. And it's never and, been removed. In fact, the, 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 the Communist Party started their, their meetings with the Pledge of Allegiance. That's what Eisenhower found out, and he, so that they, that's why they they put that uh, that uh, undercut in because they didn't like the communists reciting the uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. Well, I didn't know that they had that at the beginning of their meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So anyway, so it always bothered me any any kind of religion in schools, and eventually they did away with it, you know, and that was fine. You know, I mean, I think Madeline a kid. Madeline Murray O'Hare. Huh? Madeline Murray O'Hare sued. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's what got the prayer, organized prayer out of school. People falsely say you can't pray in school. Anybody can pray anywhere, anytime. There's no law against you wherever you are praying individually. Right. You can, you know. What you can't do is have an organized prayer forcing everybody in that classroom to pray well i never i never could figure out why in order for me to pray or to be religious i had to go to a church i mean mm -hmm. can't you just you know i mean the you know here in new york one day i'm walking down the street here's a guy who's running a newsstand he's islamic and he's on a prayer rug out in the sidewalk mm -hmm. doing his ritual right perfect mm -hmm. example of you can do it anywhere okay mm -hmm. so if you want to be religious that's fine if a kid wants to say a little prayer he can say it quietly to himself and nobody's going to mind that you know i certainly wouldn't mind that but it's when i'm forced to pray like i was when i was uh going to garfield school and i'm just a little kid you know mm -hmm. and i 
I'm Jewish. I don't. Uh, it's not, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. God damn it, Jesus Almighty. You know that they snuck that one in every single time. So, you know, I mean, and and then the, the this uh, governor of uh, Louisiana has said, and I want the government to sue me over this one. I'm happy to go to court on this. You know what's going to happen? You're going to have the pants beaten off of you. Yeah. Because this thing isn't going to stand up even even in the Supreme Court, you know. So, whatever. So <laughs> we'll see. Well, I did I did hear the Supreme Court did one good thing. It was it oh. yesterday? They said they said that uh, it's okay to take away the guns of somebody who has a domestic violence record. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, well, you know, even a, a stopwatch is right twice a day. You know what I'm saying? The uh, only person who voted against it was Clarence Thomas. Thomas. Clarence Thomas. What a what a sleaze bag he is. You know, <laughs> boy, did we make some bad choices back then? Josh, what do you think about this whole deal with prayer, uh, with the Ten Commandments being posted in every room? And can you use a staple gun to put them up? I ask. Well, I don't know about that, but uh, I mean, it, I think it'll s struggle in the courts, you know, for sure. Uh, I certainly think at the appeals court level, where it'll go first, you know, you'll probably see it struck pretty hard there, you know, uh, you know, which the the higher courts, you know, usually take into consideration. They'll obviously look at what the lower courts said first. I think you'll see a fairly broad agreement you know on its uh unconstitutional mm -hmm. status so I, I think that it'll it'll struggle pretty hard and you know even with if they keep going with it which you know they probably will uh you know just to make their point you know although it wouldn't make its way to the supreme court till after the election anyway so i don't even know if they really care about it after that it's a lot of it's to make waves and things like that you know, but I mean, I don't, I don't think it would stand up there. I mean, you know, the chief justice is certainly not someone that strikes me as open to that. He made some comments recently in that leaked audio tape that, you know, even backed that up and indicated it, you know, for all the people that have had any issue with him. I mean, right there in a private moment, there he is basically not taking bait and expressing his, you know, his neutrality on something like that. Was this Roberts? Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, I mean, you know, uh, Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Barrett have both, you know, sort of wandered off uh, some of the paths that people thought they would take previously. Justice Gorsuch, very much the same. You know, I talked to you about him, you know, five or six weeks ago one night where I was talking about some of the uh, things that I went and heard him say, you know, with how he views certain things. And, you know, I, I, I would just, I would see a lot of uh, opposition to it there, too, you know. Mm -hmm. um, because, I, and it's also something that I don't necessarily know is really that important to them and their judicial thinking. I mean, it's not really something that opens up a pathway for you know, different kinds of judicial review and philosophy and stuff like that. So I, I don't, I don't see it as anything like that. I mean, well, the governor of, of Louisiana obviously sees it differently. He, he feels really confident that the, the new justices that uh, Trump has gotten through are going to be on his side. So I say, say, we'll see. I don't know. You know, I don't but, think I don't uh, think they these, will be. I, that, 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 that's the whole reason why they're that, why they're doing it now. They really see, and it goes back to a couple of years ago, the case of the, the football coach uh, pray with his, the had the team pray in, in you know in, in on the field, and uh, so he, they're they're seeing an opening there, where they can go even farther. So, as I said, you know, Josh, I, I hope you're right. I, I hope that uh, that these people are more rational than, than we're giving them credit for. Yeah, and the, the football coach, when, you know, was a, a little bit complicated. And I, I listened to the arguments on that a while ago. 
And I mean, there was a lot of skepticism there. They they basically got through that one with some pretty narrow, you know, circumstances about, you know, a lot of which I understood completely about whether it was required and 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 things like that, you know. So, you know, but you know, forcing people to 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 pray in school um, or to have these things uh, as part of their daily look at and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's, you know, I, I just, I see some of the government incursion there that, you know, constitutional conservatives, uh, like Justice Barrett and like Justice Kavanaugh, things that sometimes make, I, I just think it makes them very nervous. I don't think they like it, you know, so they have a little bit of libertarianism in their, you know, judicial way of thinking at times. And on some of these issues, that's, you know, kind of how I think they view it is it's just not somewhere they believe the government has the right to do. Because I think they understand that, you know, the government is whoever is in control of the government in many ways. And that's, that can change, you know. So uh, I think that makes them, you know, nervous because they understand that what's maybe they see as good for them today could in a decade from now could be totally different, you know. Yeah. Because things change. Well, well, let's hope they're more libertarian than Christian nationalists, let like other people are saying they are. So we'll yeah. see. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, I just well, like I, mean, I, I don't know. They're... I don't know how you can take the uh, amendment of the Constitution uh, that, uh, you know, about the separation of church and state and then allow that to happen. And, well, and secondly, really... I got this question. They're going to put up these uh, these uh, Ten Commandments in every every single classroom in mm -hmm. uh, grade school, high school, and college, college and universities. Okay, my question is, how long do you think some of these are going to stay up there before people rip them down? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. You know, are they making a law against ripping them down? Well, I don't think they'll. You know, they no, probably won't. Even go up immediately because you know the challenges will probably go to the court pretty quick and yeah you'll probably get a stay on the execution of the law probably mm -hmm. until it's settled so you know it'll probably take 18 months and then end up being like hope you know much to do about nothing that happened in reality you know probably so you know like they may get a like a, a restraining order that says you know you can't do anything yet till it's settled or or whatever you know so yeah i mean that's you know i mean look there's a big article in politico you know four or five days ago um about you know justice barrett you know already has done some things that the people who supported her appointment have you know wrung their hands over and you know they're starting to regret it. I mean, you know, so, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's not Well, you know, I, I often said that, you know, it does, that. It, you, you think that you're putting someone in on the Supreme Court and they're going to go a certain way and that's it. Mm -hmm. But we have a complete history of people who went in there as a conservative and came out a liberal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And disappointed everybody who was on that, on their, uh, you know, on what they perceived as being their side. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, they're they're deciding large cases uh, of mega importance uh, that they don't always see, you know, in other areas that they worked in, you know, prior to that. Mm -hmm. So, look, I think for the most part, um, the large majority of justices throughout history have understood what they were up against there. I mean, you obviously have exceptions throughout the time. I mean, look, who serves on the Supreme Court is is nine people. I mean, they're people. I mean, you know, people are inherently, some of them are just not good, you know, <laughs> or have stupid things that they believe. Or I mean, look, you know, uh, look, or, I mean, if you are at work or anywhere, you see it. I mean, and it's nine people. So there's almost, it's difficult to find even one out of nine at anything, you know, it's, it's difficult to even be in a room with any nine Americans at one time where you're not standing there thinking at least one of them is a complete idiot, 
right? I mean, you know, just think about the break room at your workplace or whatever, and you go in there and there's eight other people. There's almost guaranteed to be one person. Hey, think, listen, in this group, I'm sure every in, in this in this group, I think uh, there are people here who feel there's at least right. one person here who's an idiot, and it's probably me. <laughs> okay, I'll be the idiot. You'll be, so, you'll be the nice idiot. But there's no, but there's, I'm an idiot. The worst but, thing. The worst thing about it is they can be an idiot and there's no way to vote them out or not vote for them in next time. Mm -hmm. Well, then they're set up, right, you know, so that's where people have to, to really work hard and, you know, vote based on more than just, you know, one single issue that happens to be hot that five minutes or whatever. And, and you know, look, that's where people also have to remember that, you know, 90% of the stuff that comes from the court can be basically undone by the people's representatives and they just don't do it. You know, I mean, you know, they just don't do it. And that's the mm -hmm. fault of the representatives, but it's the fault of the people who don't get rid of those representatives. You know, I mean, when it comes down to, you know, rulings that you don't like about abortion or about IVF or about birth control or about student loans, or whatever you know i mean the representatives of of you know us they can mm -hmm. make federal laws that change that i mean because so many of these rulings that come out the court didn't say it was unconstitutional they said the people that made the rule didn't have the power to do it under our constitution but if these folks over here do it fair game and those folks mm -hmm. over there just don't do it they just choose to not have our congressional members do anything and then interest groups fight it out in the courts you know super funded by mm -hmm. acts and billionaires and you know all kinds of other things you know uh, uh media that's not real media it's more like an arm of a pack or a, a biased media you know on both sides and things like that they've just decided that rather than do things through the political system They'll do things to the judicial system. You know, we're the ones that have given all this power to the to all these judges, not just in this, the Supreme Court. Well, let, let's talk for a second. Everywhere. Let's talk for a second. Um, oh, yes, Jeff. I want to say that, you know, we used to have six judge, and now we have nine. Did we Did we have six at one time? Yeah. Uh, yeah. A long time ago. Yeah, a long time yeah. ago. The number has changed over the years, yeah. Yeah. But, but anyway, uh, the nine really makes it more difficult to make it this, uh, an agreement between those seven people. I mean, well, they're never going to agree. I mean, they're so yeah. so polarized yeah. these days. You know, there was a time that you could kind of th think that the Supreme Court was literally voting on things based on interpreting the Constitution. Now, correct me on this, Josh, but isn't the job of the Supreme Court to decide on issues based on the Constitution? Well, that's typically what cases are there for. And the, but it's not supposed to be their mm -hmm. own opinion of what's right and wrong. They're, that's not the option. The job here is to interpret the Constitution. Hey, Supreme Court, I've got a question about this. They want to have uh, the Ten Commandments in a school. How do you rule on that? Well, let's take a look at the t let's take a look at the Constitution, mm -hmm. and uh, then they they vote on it based on the Constitution. That's the way it used to be. That's not the way it is now. No, yeah. I mean we're well, about. I don't, I don't know if it's not the way that it is now. I think you, there there have been evolving you know, philosophies of judicial review over the last few decades. And I think that we also give them many, many, many more cases that used to be solved without going to them that never went to them because it was taken care of by the legislature prior to that. And mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. went by that, you know, th their representatives had made the laws and when they didn't like it, they got different representatives or, or, or whatever. But we've moved into an era where we all have abdicated our responsibility and participation in that to the courts. You know, I mean, even Congress has done it. I mean, Congress has abdicated much of its power 
to the executive branch and to the judicial branch, even though the legislative branch was designed to be, you know, the leading wing of, you know, the tripart government. I mean, and they're not, they're not leading at all. In fact, they just go wherever the wind takes them and then let the other two branches figure it out. Well, now we have, we have down in uh, uh, Florida, this uh, judge, what's her name? I don't even, can't even remember. Eileen Cannon. Eileen Cannon, who even other judges on the bench in that state are asking her to, you know, abdicate, get out of the job of handling this case because they feel, number one, she's not experienced enough to do it. And secondly, she's she's dragging her feet on everything. She's trying to slow this process down so it's never going to take place while uh, Trump is running for president. Mm-hmm. You know, in any other court, this thing probably would have already gone to court and been uh, been adjudicated. Mm-hmm. But Eileen Cannon is this this fool. I mean, she's horrible. She's terrible, in, and the judges the down there, and by the way, those judges who want her to, to abdicate and to get out of the way are all conservative judges. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, she's a terrible judge. You know, I mean, she probably has no business being there. I mean, but, you know, our country elected Did, someone like Trump and along with that comes the consequences of the power that the executive is given and you know there used to be a philosophy that said you know the executive would never appoint such a uh, an ass clown to to such a position because it's confirmable by the Senate and they are the check you know if you've got one person who is acting a fool We've got a hundred people over here who can look at it and say, no, that's not going to happen. You need yeah. to find someone better. We have judged this person is not worthy. Try again. But what you've got into is is this, you know, whatever the guy at the top says goes. You know, the, the parties don't, uh, they don't even push back within their own, you know, parties. Well, so, today, today she was spending the whole day hearing arguments that the Trump people were making about why the special prosecutor shouldn't be the special prosecutor because he had not been okayed by the Senate. Uh, Which, Which, by the way, in most cases, never happens. Yes, I mean, they're making ridiculous arguments. And she's sitting there doing the slowest possible job of adjudicating this particular question rather than just saying, hey, uh, forget it, he's the, you know... He's a special prosecutor, and that's it. Yeah, you know. Well, one thing about this about the story is that uh, well, I think it, it was a New York Times. I haven't read the article yet, but uh, the there were two particular judges that talked. I guess one was was uh, was uh, uh, put on the court by by George Bush, but they were arguing that the trial should be in a Miami courthouse with a more experienced judge. Uh, supposedly, I don't know. If no, they or, they said that she should. Pro- the, 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 the courthouse no. that she is 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 miles away from Miami, and on top of that, does not have the have the facilities. That's or did it. not have the facilities for viewing or holding these classified documents. Right. Those facilities exist in courthouses in Miami, but because she refused to recuse her recuse recuse herself. Yeah. They, they actually had to build those facilities in her courthouse. I, I don't think they built them yet, but they're going to. Dark. Yeah. What's that? They, they, I don't think they built them yet, but they have to build them now. But they have to build and them, And the yeah. cost of that is prohibitive. Yeah. So she's not only, you know, dragging the case in, in favor of, of, of Trump, but she's costing the taxpayers a lot of money, needlessly. Well, you know, I mean, the thing is that the, 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 these uh, uh, judges and so on, we always look to to be the arbiter of situations. And now you can't, you can't count on them to be the arbiter of anything. They're simply giving out their personal opinion about something rather than looking at the legal ramifications. And They're it's, supposed to call balls and strikes. That's period. right. That's right. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, y- and you know about that, don't you? Uh, well, I, but I don't know that we can put all of them in that, uh, you know, category. I, I think the vast majority of them we cannot. I think we have a few high-profile ones that have worked themselves into, you know, situations where it's it's influencing, you know, their judicial philosophy, and I think they're ruining the good name of the courts, uh, mm-hmm. you know, through those actions, but... We've also, like I said, though, we've also allowed it to evolve that way. I mean, you know, we've we've taken issues that really 100% should be handled by the legislative branch, and rather than them doing anything about it, we're just having people bring lawsuits and things like that, and then just, we're just settling it that way. I mean, you know, so let me ask a newly let, let me ask a newly minted father here. <laughs> although hardly not newly minted, but about seven, eight years ago. Uh, 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 Brian, uh, how do you feel about, let's say in California, they suddenly said they had to put the Ten Commandments in the classroom. How would you feel about that vis-a-vis Adrian? Yeah, I don't care for it. Yeah. I, 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 you know, for me, I don't care... I don't care about religion. I don't care about sexuality. I don't care about all this stuff, right? I'll, I'll help, you know, whatever. But, but when it's pushed upon you, you know, that's where I have an issue. So, yeah. so the whole, the whole, you know, have it out there. I mean, my mom, when I was when I was young, you know, she knew that I was going to Presbyterian church, but I was going there really just to hang out with my friends, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But she was always saying, you know, any religion is fine for you, you know, just, you know, whatever you feel is fine. But to have it pushed upon you is where I don't really care about it. It's funny. My parents never seemed to have, you know, they knew I was going to school. And every day I was, maybe Father Larry would come up from the church and give an invocation to the class. And they didn't seem that bothered by it. They didn't like it, you know. They didn't like it, but they didn't, nobody made a big deal deal out of it. So, you know. so what happens when it, when a seven-year-old or six-year-old asks their parents, what's adultery? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, that's the part of it, too. What, it's going to be one these things the students, they're like, they don't even know. Well, yeah, the students in class, what they, if they ask the teacher, what is adultery? No, well, that is something that grows in the forest and is boring. <laughs> it's when a man really likes a woman and then the man likes another woman <laughs> more than he likes the other woman yeah well and he's not mormon yes yeah i mean uh, uh, have you brought up adrian with any religion or or do you just do you have him no no about no, that? no no but she but she understands some of that and and you know i, I what i tell her is what i've always believed in it's great for people to have faith. You know, you have faith in something. You know, Josh may have faith in the Cincinnati Bengals. You know, but no, you know what you should have faith in something, and and if that gets them through the day, if that gets them onto their next level of, of a person, I, I believe that's very very good. But like I said, I don't like when people are knocking at my door and come to me and say, "Oh, God saves," and I said, "Well, I was 11 years old when my mom passed away. So are you telling me God did that for a reason?" And they said, oh, yes. I said, well, why would God take an only child, take his mother away from him? I mean, that makes no sense, you know, and then they usually walk away after that. So, yeah. Yeah, I just, as I said, I knew somebody when the Seventh-day Adventists came to his door or the Mormons would come to his door. Or Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses would come to his door. Uh, He would simply say hello to them naked. Yeah. (laughs) And they never came back. You yeah, know. actually, my uh, adopted parents, uh, Tad and Alice, they had a friend that did the same thing. When the whole Jehovah's Witness you came to the door, they would take off their clothes. And, oh, yeah, tell us more. <laughs> well, you know, I, I've, had, I've had people call me up on the phone and do some kind of a lip religious thing. And then I would start yelling and screaming the most filthy, obscene words you can possibly imagine back into the phone. And they said, my God, how can you do that? I said, hey, you called me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, but it, it, I, I've always been bothered by people trying to inflict their religion on me. 
Mm -hmm. and what's going on in Louisiana is inflicting your religion on me. And you're right. Which Ten Commandments? The Catholic yeah. Ten Commandments? The Baptist Ten Commandments? The Jewish Ten Commandments? The, I just read the Mormon Ten Commandments. I mean, come on. And how much is how much is this going to cost? And can you imagine the the printer with the contract? I wonder what kind of kickbacks are going to be coming back to the governor. Well, as I the, say, I wonder how many of them get ripped down. They get they ripped down. They have to be replaced, and that's more of expense. You know, they're very specific about how big they are, the lettering, the font, whatever. And I'm sure they've got uh, their their printer lined up, and he's lining, or that person, or that company's lining their pockets to get that printing job. That's right. It, uh, uh, they, yeah, yeah. they swear that the um, no taxpayer dollars will be spent to put up these signs. Well, where are they going to get the money? Private con, con con contributions. Do you think they're going to get well? How how expensive? Are they going to be tax deductible contributions? I don't know. <laughs> the article I read said that, that they specifically said no taxpayer dollars are going to be used to do this. But if they're tax uh, deductible, then that's loss of tax revenue. Good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's funny because when I when I saw that news story, they were showing it looked like a tombstone, you know, like marble or something, yeah. and they had it all chiseled in, right? Yeah, Charlie, you yeah. see that? Yeah, and they were saying, oh, they're going to have the Ten Commandments. And, oh, well, are they going to use? Gonna put that. I mean, that's like very expensive. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, what the hell? Uh, we're we're kind of we're kind of nuts in this country now. There are people who are doing this kind of thing just to piss other people off. Yeah. Hey, I woke up this morning. And I decided I found a figured out a good way as the governor of Louisiana. Yes, I could do a lot of good works, but the first thing I want to do is piss people off by trying to make this law and get this law passed that we have to have the Ten Commandments in all the classrooms. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's just well, ridiculous. they actually see themselves as saving the country. I mean, once again, they, they're Christian nationalists. And, yep. and, and, and they believe that our uh, secular secular uh, path is, uh, is the cause of all the problems that the country is having. And they're saving us from from all those problems. They're going to solve all our problems uh, just like they did in The Handmaid's Tale, you know? Yeah, yeah. But Which, by the way, I, I, I read both of those books uh, the past few months. Definitely read them. Yeah, the, uh, Margaret Atwood, well, what's uh, books, uh, The Handmaid's Tale. Yeah, Great. read them before they were legal. <laughs> yeah, before they were legal, yeah. <laughs> I mean, just amazing. I think they've already been banned in Texas. Have they really? Oh, in the schools, yeah. yes. Yeah, banned books list. Yeah. Wow, jeez. Ah, what kind of world do we live in today? Well, a world in which I can play the theme. Uh, and there it is. Uh, it's been good having you all here tonight. This has been a good little discussion. Yeah, we didn't even talk about printers. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even talk about what? Printers. Yeah. HP oh, 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 HP printers. Yeah. 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 Well, that's only because Alan isn't here tonight. You know. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Josh. Appreciate the call. Love having you here. Uh, I call it a call. I probably shouldn't call it that. That's an old person saying, thanks for calling. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, of course, uh, our good friend, Charlie Wallace. Thank you so much. Vernon Nunn, good to have you here. Tom Yamaguchi, always wonderful. Jeffrey Stein, we know you're here every night. We love having you here. Uh, <laughs> and finally, uh, Brian Neary. Uh, why doesn't everybody give a big wave goodbye, and I'll give a big wave goodbye at you, okay? Good night, everybody. There they go. That's our citizen panel for tonight. Uh, there'll be another one uh, starting right after we're through here with Amy uh, Manuel, who uh, takes your calls on Skype at GabNet Live. I will see you again on Monday when we do that 4 o'clock show that goes out over Facebook called the uh, Pop-Up Show. And then we'll be back here again on Wednesday, same time, same station in life. And in the meantime, as always, if you see her, you know, tell her I love her, okay? 
Bye-bye.